From the Toronto Star, I'm Sabah Itazaz, and this matters. It's been a race against time. Less than a year after the virus came the vaccines. As deadly COVID-19 spread rapidly and devastated the world, we fought back, a massive global undertaking that led to life-saving vaccines less than a year since this has hit us. Canadians are rolling up their sleeves to get that shot. The first doses of the approved Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine are already here, and Moderna is next. The U.S. biotech firm Moderna will be delivering thousands of doses to Canada by the end of December, and they can start rolling out to Canadians as soon as Health Canada gives the green light. And we wouldn't have these vaccines or know what we know so far without the people who went in blind, those who participated in the clinical trials. So in today's episode, one of the earliest volunteers for the Moderna vaccine trials, Ian Hayden from Seattle, opens up about what that was like and answers many of our questions about this vaccine. Hi, Ian. Thanks so much for joining me. Hey, glad to be with you. Ian, how does it feel taking part in probably what's one of the most high stakes human medical experiment ever conducted? Any regrets? <laughs> it's been quite a journey. You know, I'll say up top, I certainly have no regrets at all. You know, I think this is obviously a historic moment we're living through, and I'm glad to have played this small part. And, you know, I look forward to what's to come with these vaccines with the rollout. And what made you want to participate in this? I know you're a science communications manager yourself, so you must have viewed this from both a personal and kind of a scientific angle as well, right? That's right. Yeah. You know, I live here in Seattle and I happen to work in biotechnology. I write about it. And Seattle, you know, by coincidence, was one of the states in the U.S. that was hit hard by COVID the earliest. And also by coincidence, you know, the world's first COVID vaccine trial happened to be here in my city. So it's not something I would have sought out otherwise. It really was just that coincidence of it being my city here. And when I saw an opportunity, you know, to sign up, you have to keep in mind, this was back in March of 2020, when, you know, here in the state of Washington, there were fewer than 100 COVID cases known. And that was more than any other state in the country. So this was a different world back in March. And, you know, it seemed clear that the pandemic was going to get a lot worse. And this trial was right at my doorstep. So signing up seemed like the obvious thing to do. And when you decided that you were going to be a part of this trial, how did your friends, your family react to this, especially as the situation progressed to what we are seeing now? And I also heard your mom wasn't really on board at first, and that ended up on an interesting twist. So do tell me about that as well. Yeah, I mean, everyone's been very supportive of me, certainly all my loved ones, those I know, you know, they're glad I'm doing this. I've got a lot of friends who are themselves scientists, including some who work with me at the University of Washington. I know some of them were actually jealous that I got in and they didn't. They had also applied. Turns out many thousands of people in the Seattle area applied for what was originally just 45 seats. But like I said, my friends and family have been very supportive. My mother was the person out of everyone who had the most questions to ask, right? She wanted to know, what is this trial that I might be signing up for? What are the risks? What are they going to be doing to me? How long is it going to last? And she and I spoke by phone a number of times about, you know, all those details. And, you know, she never really opposed me joining the trials. You know, as a mother, she just had concerns and wanted to know more. And, you know, fast forward the tape a couple months, I am in phase one of the Moderna trial. When phase three rolled around several months later, and it was available at about 100 different cities here in the U.S. where people could take part, one of those trial cities was Sacramento, California, where she lives. And she actually ended up signing up and becoming a participant herself in phase three of the Moderna trial. Wow. You really convinced her. Yeah. I, I must have been persuasive. Yeah. Okay. So the Moderna vaccine trial is a blind study, right? Where participants don't know if they're getting a COVID-19 vaccine or a placebo. How does that work exactly? So that is true in phase three, which is the biggest part of the trial that involves tens of thousands of people, people like my mom, for example. So in that study and a lot of the other phase three studies, half the participants are going to get the real vaccine and half are going to get a placebo, usually just salt water. And then you watch and see, you know, among the people who really got vaccinated, do they get COVID less frequently than the people who got a placebo? And so that's really how we scientifically, we measure the efficacy of an experimental vaccine. In my case, in phase one, it's a little bit different. My phase one, my early trial had no placebo. So everybody in the phase one trial really gets the vaccine. And in my case, we got, you know, one of three doses, a low dose, a medium dose, and a high dose. Because early on in the trial, the initial question is actually not 
does the vaccine work and is it protective? The first question you have to know is, is it safe to give to people? And you just don't know that until you put it into a human for the first time. And you also don't know what dose is appropriate, you know, what is going to give an effect and what is going to be too much. So I was in that early phase one trial and I was actually one of the first people who received the highest dose of the Moderna vaccine. And based on that experience, based on, you know, this initial study, it was deemed actually that the high dose is probably too high and it was the medium dose that was selected to go forward with. Right. That's something I will get into the details of with you as well, because I understand you had somewhat of a unique experience that helped form this conclusion. But first of all, what was the signing or screening process like? Like you said, a lot of your friends also applied for it and they didn't get in. What's the eligibility parameter for this? I imagine it must be pretty extensive. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. So it's often difficult to recruit for clinical trials. It can take some time to fill them up. That's been different with COVID. There's been luckily plenty of people to sign up for most of these trials. And phase one is different than phase two, and that's different than phase three. But in my case, for phase one, in the first in human trial, they're only looking for people who basically have a blank health history. They want people who are in good health, who aren't taking any complicated medications, who don't have a history of a certain chronic illness, because those people may have more vulnerability than others to a new vaccine, for example. So in my case, I believe I was selected, you know, out of this pool of many, many thousands of people who applied simply because you know, I am lucky enough to be in good health and I don't have any medical complications. And that was exactly the type of person they were looking for. So how do they assess that? Is there a questionnaire? Do they do a physical? What was the process like? Yeah. So the very first point of contact I had was just an online form saying, you know, my name and my age and where I live and that I can make it to the clinic. They called me back pretty quickly after filling out that form and asked me some basic questions about my health history, most of which was blank, like I said. And then the first in-person visit is a physical, pretty standard physical and some blood work as well. And they need to look at the blood work as sort of the last measure to make sure that there isn't some underlying illness or condition wrong with you that maybe you didn't even know about. So once those results came back in, I then got a call from the clinic. This was still back in the spring saying, okay, everything looks good. You are an eligible participant. You fit the age range. Health history is fine. Are you still willing to sign up? And at that point, you sign up and schedule your first injection. And you're sort of a pioneer going into this. How were you feeling going through that process? Were you nervous, a little afraid? Did you have any second thoughts at some point? You know, I didn't have second thoughts. You know, there were some nerves. I was surprised, actually. You know, I remember day of the injection when I was going to go in and get the first shot of two. I remember before going into the clinic, sort of pausing a moment and checking in with myself to see, you know, how nervous do I feel? Am I sweating? How am I? And I felt surprisingly calm. You know, I think part of that for me was the clinical staff who were running this trial. They're just excellent. It was a specialist group. Really, all they do is experimental vaccines, new vaccines. And so they worked before on malaria and influenza and all kinds of things. They were real pros. And they took the time to answer all of my questions. You know, obviously, we're in an unusual time with this vaccine, and it's an accelerated timeline, and, you know, things are moving quickly. But I can say as someone in the trial, as someone at one of the earliest points of the trial, I never felt rushed. It was never as though they were short on time with me. And so that gave me a lot of confidence that, you know, this is being done right. I'm in good hands. And I think it's important to keep in mind, big picture is we got to these vaccines because people volunteered for these trials. That's the only way it can get done. And so, you know, if no one is willing to take on that tiny amount of risk, we weren't going to end up with a vaccine. And fortunately, enough people did. And here we are on the brink of some really good news. That's absolutely a very good point, Ian. Also, it's good to know that there's a team there that answers your questions. Take us through the first appointment a little. So you just go there, you just show up for the injections and that's it? Yeah, it's interesting. So the two injection visits I had each lasted three hours. So I spent a whole morning there and they really take their time. So when you come in again, at this point, I've already signed the forms. I'm officially enrolled. But again, we sort of review the consent form. We review what is going on here today. And if I still want to participate, they check again to see if I'm feeling well, if I've come down with a fever or anything. No, still feeling good. And as well, they took some blood. They did some blood work before they gave me the initial vaccination. And that's what they're going to compare against going forward, looking for you know changes in antibody levels, things like that. Then they give you the shot. And to be honest, if I had had my eyes closed, I wouldn't have even known that it happened. It was completely painless. It took just a couple seconds. And as part of the study protocol as well, especially in phase one, they actually had us wait at the clinic for a full hour after getting the injection. 
I'm just sort of sitting in an exam room. I spent the time on my phone. And that's because, you know, one of the theoretical risks of any new vaccine or any new injection is anaphylactic shock, is an allergic reaction that could come. And if that was going to happen, they wanted us to be around healthcare workers. And so I spent that time at the clinic. Fortunately, I was fine. I had no history of allergies. That was one of the things they had asked about. And, you know, it's interesting because we're now seeing as the vaccine rolls out in the UK, this issue of anaphylaxis has popped up. And, you know, from what I've heard, maybe two patients in the UK who've received the vaccine, who already had allergies, appear to have had allergic reactions to their shots, the kind of thing that you need an EpiPen for. So from the earliest days of these trials, that's been on the mind of these researchers and something that they're very cautious about. We'll be right back. And like we were talking about earlier, you were part of Moderna's very first phase of these trials. And from what I understand, you're one of the three people who had a pretty intense experience during. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, sure. So I mentioned before that one of the things that a phase one trial is designed to look for is dosing. Nobody knows what the right dose is before you begin these experiments. And so in my trial, there was a low dose of the vaccine, a medium and a high. And it's as much as 10 times more vaccine in the high dose than it is in the low dose. So there's quite a range. I was selected to be one of the people to first receive the high dose. It could have been anyone. They just sort of assign it randomly. And after my first injection, I was fine. Actually, I just had a little bit of arm pain standard for any vaccination, but that went away and I was feeling good. A month later, I went back to the clinic for the second injection, again of the high dose, and the injection was fine, still painless. You know, I had the same arm pain that came on, but actually about 12 hours after receiving that second dose, so later that evening, I started developing symptoms and basically I got all the symptoms that we had been told to look out for. So things like a fever, aches, headache, muscle pain, even more pain at the injection site. Basically all the stuff that could have happened happened and hit me kind of hard. So in the middle of the night, I woke up with a high fever and all these other symptoms going on. And as trial participants, we had been given a 24-hour call line where we could reach the vaccine researchers and they wanted us to call if we had any symptoms. So we called in at about four in the morning and they advised that I should go to urgent care so that they could look at me directly and so that they could run some tests on me as this was happening. So we did that. We got there again quite early in the morning. I only spent about two hours there. They gave me some IV fluids and some Tylenol to help with the fever and then discharged me. I ended up still having symptoms, nausea, other issues for the remainder of the day. So for about 24 hours in total. But by the time I went to bed the next evening and woke up again, I was actually fine. I was symptom free. You know, I had missed the night of sleep. So I was feeling a bit fatigued still. But all of those really intense side effects that I experienced, high fever, headache, muscle aches, things like that. In my case, they spiked pretty high. They were treated pretty easily and they resolved within 24 hours. But based on that pretty unpleasant evening, that high reaction that I had, and it seems as well that perhaps two other participants in my trial who also received the high dose may have had a similar day or two like mine. Based on those reactions, the decision was made that that high dose is probably too high. And so they move forward with the medium dose of the vaccine, which still seemed to give the positive immune reaction they were looking for, but had much, much less of that intense side effect. So you really played a role in ascertaining the right dosage for this vaccine and potentially helped your mom down the line during her clinical trial, right? That's right. Yeah. And that brings me a huge amount of comfort. You know, you don't know what's going to happen in these trials until you do it. And, you know, when people have understandably concerns about vaccine safety and the speed of this rollout, I think it's important to keep in mind that it's not as though these vaccines are untested. They are really tested on real people like me. And this is how we know, this is how we can eventually have confidence that the vaccine is both safe and effective is because these trials have taken place. And yeah, it gives me a huge amount of comfort to know that, you know, of course, I didn't want to get sick and I had an unpleasant evening back in the spring. But if that is my sacrifice, if that's the worst thing that happens to me during the pandemic, you know, I'll actually be one of the lucky ones compared to what can happen with COVID. And if that experience shapes the trial, if it can get us closer to the right dose, to something that's going to be safe for lots and lots of people, that's an easy price to pay. It's still amazing that you're doing this. And what about your mom? How's she been doing? 
She's great. Yeah. So she's in phase three. So she's one of those people who is a 50-50 chance whether she actually got the vaccine or placebo, but she's doing well. Her two injections, her first one was fine. And her second one, she had some fatigue and maybe some muscle ache as well for about 24 hours. Nothing as severe as mine, but we still don't know for sure whether that was the vaccine or a placebo effect, but she's good. She's had both of her injections for a while now. She's just continuing to be monitored as part of the trial. Obviously, there is still things that we are learning, which we will be learning over time as it is with all vaccines. Do you worry a little about any potential impact on you long term? Do you think about that? I really don't know, to be honest. It has a bit to do with how these vaccines work and how vaccines work in general. The Moderna vaccine, as well as the Pfizer vaccine, both use a relatively new vaccine technology. They're the mRNA vaccines. And those are new to people. Those haven't been licensed for people before. They are used widely in livestock. Livestock use mRNA vaccines as well. But an interesting property about those vaccines, I think that isn't often talked about, is the RNA molecules themselves. That's the part of the vaccine that's new. And this is sort of my biology background speaking here. But RNA is an interesting molecule for all kinds of reasons. But one interesting thing about it is that it's a very unstable molecule. It's not a molecule that can survive very long. It's very easily broken down. And we can see this actually in these logistical problems around especially the Pfizer vaccine needing to be kept so ice cold. A big reason for that is how unstable these molecules are. They just fall apart. And so when it comes to really long-term effects of being vaccinated with a RNA molecule, you know, the problem, scientifically speaking, is actually getting the RNA to last long enough to have a beneficial effect on the body, not that it might stick around in the body for months or years. That's extremely unlikely with a molecule like this. And Ian, I've seen you tweeting about this so I know you do have opinions about this. Do you feel that a lot of stories such as yours about the initial side effects, etc., are being turned into fuel for disinformation, for anti-vaccine theories, for instance? Are you worried about that? I am, yeah. You know, it's an interesting conundrum here because I think people should expect to have their questions answers about these vaccines, right? We should have transparency in this process. I think that that's critical, and that's why I'm speaking out as a trial participant people should know what's going on here and feel confident about it. And part of that means acknowledging the reality that sometimes when you get a vaccine, you might have a brief fever or you might have muscle aches. That's part of the immune response to getting vaccinated. And that's not something to hide. But what's really unfortunate is that those stories, which are true, are so often distorted and twisted in order to become much more scary than they really are. And that's been especially true for me. You know, I've lived that these last couple of months. I was one of the first figures to publicly report one of the first people to publicly report having some symptoms as a result of a COVID vaccine. And within 24 hours, my story had become distorted and stretched and just turned into a lie about what happened to me, how severe my reaction was, what this means about whether or not you could ever take a COVID vaccine from people who really don't seem to care much about what the truth is around these vaccines. They seem more interested in scaring people about vaccines. And I think that's a real shame. I think that erodes confidence. And, you know, people should recognize when that happens and try to listen to primary sources, to experts who can provide that sort of commentary, that nuance of, you know, what is to be expected here and what's really out of bounds. Ian, what are some of the misconceptions around the COVID-19 vaccines that you've come across since joining this trial? Are there any that you'd like to address? Well, there's a couple, I guess. You know, I think a common sense that I'm hearing from a lot of people is that these vaccines because they're happening at an accelerated rate, they must necessarily be unsafe. I think a lot of people, that just seems logical to them, is how could you ever make a vaccine this quickly? And, you know, in the United States, we have this Operation Warp Speed. I'm sure you've heard about the federal government's effort to pour money into this to accelerate the process. And, you know, I think it's good to unleash public funding to get this work done quickly. But I think, you know, the name is an unfortunate one, Warp Speed. We're in an emergency, we're in a crisis, and we want to arrive at a safe and effective vaccine as quickly as possible. And spending lots of money on that project is a great idea, but cutting corners and making a product that is less safe, that hasn't really been tested, that is obviously a mistake. And that is not something that is happening in the case of these vaccines. These trials really are taking place. They are enormous trials. Actually, they're larger than a typical vaccine trial would be. They involve more people. People like me have had vaccine in them for more than half a year at this point with no issues to report. I'm feeling fine. So it's not as though this is just being skipped over. These trials are taking place and people should know that. And then, you know, at the end of the day, it's going to come down to what regulators make of the data and how much transparency there is around that review process. 
And people should, I think, really pay attention to that. There may be scare stories along the way. For example, if you heard a mistaken story about what happened to me that suggested that what happened to me was much more severe than it really was, those scare stories are meant to grab your attention, but they don't represent what's really going on in these trials. And so I think like with everything else in 2020, we need a little bit of patience here and we need to wait and see what experts have to say about the totality of the data when we actually have it. And do you have any advice for anyone who might be considering being a part of a vaccine clinical trial like you? I think it's a great idea. You know, it's not for everyone. There's all kinds of reasons why you wouldn't want to do it, whether you're not comfortable doing it, or maybe you're not in a position where you can take on a little bit of risk. That's fine. But, you know, I think people should think seriously if they are the type of person who is needed for a clinical trial. It is a wonderful way where you can really be part of the solution in a time and a year when it's so easy to feel stuck, it's so easy to feel depressed and hopeless. Being part of a clinical trial is a very concrete way in which you can responsibly use your body, use your health to help lots of other people. You shouldn't do it to try to win protection for yourself. That's not a good reason to join a clinical trial, but to speed up a solution and something that's going to have reach for your own loved ones, for people in your city, for people in your country and around the world. I think it's something you should consider if there is a trial that is trying to recruit volunteers in your area. Well, thank you for being on the podcast, Ian. And more than that, I think I speak for many of us when I say we do owe you a debt of gratitude for what you've done on the front lines of this. So thank you for that, too. Well, it was great speaking with you. Thank you so much. Ian Hayden is a science communications manager at the University of Washington in Seattle and a phase one trial participant of the Moderna COVID-19 vaccine. That's it for today. Thanks so much for listening. This Matters is hosted and produced by me, Sabai Tazaz, Adrian Chung, and Raju Mutter, produced and mixed by Sean Pattenden, and our director of programming is JP Fozo. Our show theme music is by So Called, and our episode music is by Mike DeAngelis. We want to hear what stories matter to you. Please send us comments, questions, or ideas to thismatters at thestar.ca. Please consider supporting the journalism the Toronto Star Newsroom does at thestar.com. And don't forget to subscribe to This Matters on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Let's talk soon. 